lovely to be sharing um, a morning with you. Uh, what we thought we'd do is um, uh, I'll start off because I really wanted to talk about our collective memories, particularly of starting out, because I think it's it's the first yard we were involved with, the first time we got into racing, which is the thing of, uh, I know talking to everybody that we all remember most. We all remember the first yard we went to. We remember the first head lad or, or trainer. And we remember the first horse we rode and the uh, first um, uh, winner we rode, if we're lucky to do that and all that sort of stuff. So I thought what we do is I'll, um, I'll talk for about a quarter of an hour about what happened to me. <laughs> And then I'm really keen that you should come in and tell me um, what happened to you and uh, and any other things that you'd like me to talk about. Um, obviously, as you know, I after doing my spell riding, where I was very lucky, considering I didn't have any background in it really, but I got a, a privileged um, leg up from a father having a horse. I actually turned professional and had what seemed to be quite a lot, 100 winners, uh, and then luckily in many ways got hurt. Um, and in desperation got going on telly and newspapers and to some extent I've been doing that ever since. But what really unites all of us is that we all, for better or for worse, um, got hooked with the whole madness but uh, let me just tell you about what happened to me. My, I, some of you may be older than me, but not not that many of you. But I, I was born in 1942, uh, in just outside London. Blitz was on, all that sort of stuff. My father was in sort of naval intelligence, so we went around a bit. But fundamentally, I remember growing up in post-war London, Paddington, where. I mean, it's all very grey, but we did have... My dad had won a couple of pointer points in the sort of 20s. <laughs> and he did follow racing, and I followed it. And therefore, but at that stage, you know, you're in London. Pretty grey place. No question of um, uh, of racing, me actually riding anything. But then we moved to the country near Broadway. Um, and there there were ponies and hunting. And the whole idea was to ride in the pointer point. And again, the key for me was that rather than just riding the point of point, the great thing was to go to a local stable. And the nearest stable to me was Frenchy Nicholson stable at Cheltenham at Presbury. And as it happened, Frenchy Nicholson had been a champion jockey, and uh, but he his training, his main owner, Dorothy Paget, had died. And he he was a natural teacher of jockeys he, he had been a jockey but he loved teaching he was a bit of a sort of in some ways he was quite childish which made such a good teacher he loved sharing things and of course he became a teacher to rather better people than me i.e <laughs> uh, in no particular order but probably in chronological paul cook uh pat henry uh walter swinburne uh you know he, he had a whole host of other fred messer a whole lot of other really good apprentices um but he loved to share that. So going to his stable, having never been involved with racing, was fantastic for me. And I mean, I can even remember the first time I, I sat on the thoroughbred, which, but I mean, compared to some kids who got going when they were 12, I was talking to Ron Moore, who said he was first riding a thoroughbred when he was 11, um, in, in, in a country of thoroughbred. But I must have been 17. But I remember a mare called Thelma's Cuda. And I remember talking to we went from Presbury, his yard was right by the end of the race course at Presbury, top of the hill there. And we walk through Presbury, up Mill Lane, up onto the top of Cleve Hill and canter around there. And I rode this man called Thelma's Cuter and on the way home, Frenchie was walking beside me and I remember putting my hand round and patting her on the back, not realising that that's, you don't do that for the thoroughbred. And she pucked me straight off. Um, but then uh, again, I got very keen uh, and uh, 
writing a pointer pointer, which I did do, um, sort of not enough. And I remember forget my first ride in a hurdle race, which was at, um, at War Hunt. And any of you remember War Hunt uh, up in Shropshire? And um, uh, it's a little tiny man called Tam Hill. Uh, it was twice run for two miles. I think there were 21 runners. Uh, and I had never been so fast in my life. Um, there were sort of cow pats and things. <laughs> uh, and um, I think we beat two. Uh, but it was amazing. And of course, I was hooked. But as we all know, the snag is that it then just depends on how the ball rolls for you because if you then get to other rides that actually win things you then get more and at any one stage you can get hit and snuffed out and funnily enough as you know I've been for 40 years involved with the Indian Jockeys Fund and was chairman for 15 years or well, 10 years um, in my I think six point to point ride I had a fall at Lockinge uh, from a nutty horse called Mr Conquer, who I'd won on actually a previous race, but he he tended to miss. He missed the open ditch and turned somersault, but he threw me about 30 yards ahead of him and then rolled and landed on top of me. And I went to Rad the Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, which some of you will know, in the back of a minivan and I'd actually got uh, a little break in my neck but it was actually as you all know how little the difference can be just a tiny hairline fracture and it didn't matter whereas you know if it, the angles had been slightly different I'd have been in a wheelchair you know <laughs> perhaps at best uh, and that's the game we're in and anybody as you know forget about riding in races um cantering up warren hill or cantering anywhere a horse can turn over and um and in many ways i think we have the worst falls when a horse breaks his leg cantering along um because you've got no warning and, and you it's horrible but anyway that's part of the challenge of the whole thing is that we we know it's not a it's not a risk-free zone. By the way, it's really nice of you to write in because I'm I'm getting messages coming in here. Maureen Maureen Marklew just called in, saying her late husband was head lad for Bill Tellwright, who lived near Warrior. I remember Bill Tellwright, Mister W Tellwright. Uh, he had several winners at War. And it's a good story about Bill Tellwright because he won the race in which at Cheltenham in which John Oaksey committed the biggest cock-up in the history of racing, just about, because uh, there was a, about a three or four runner amateur riders chase at Cheltenham, and coming to the last turn, there were only two runners, two survivors, one of which was John Oaksey, the other was Bill Tellwright, and John Oaksey was about... 30 lengths ahead, if that, more probably. But as he came around the last bend, there'd been a whole lot of new railings done. And as he came round the turn towards the last bend, he thought he'd taken the wrong turn. He had a sort of, and he stopped, pulled up, and went back. And as Bill came round, he said, uh, we're going the wrong way, Bill. Bill ignored him, jumped the last fence, and... <laughs> And duly won. And John came round. John rode a grey horse called Pioneer Spirit, I remember. Uh, uh, and it must have been the most fortuitous victory that any jockey's ever had. Anyway, that's the story of, <laughs> of Bill Tellwright that I remember, um, Maureen. But no, we were talking about getting going and, and how we all remember first places. I mean, Frenchie Nicholson was such a lovely guy and he was so enthusiastic and he used to watch you riding in a way that um, no other trainer I ever dealt with did because he had been a proper jockey and he he would encourage you but if you did something silly he would 
he would pick you up on it. There wouldn't be any great shoutings, but he would be, if he was disappointed, like all best teachers, you really wanted to do better. And I remember one day at Warwick when anyone remembers one of the things you used to do as a kid was to was to practice turning your whip over in your fingers. And um, uh, going around the last turn at Warwick, I went to turn the whip over my fingers <laughs> and it, 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 I lost it and came in, finished about fifth. Uh, and I hoped that Frenchie wouldn't have seen, but he had. I remember in those days, there was no telling for anything, no, 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 just watch, you watch with binoculars. Uh, and, but to have someone on your case who did that was absolutely wonderful. And I mean, you know, uh, unfortunately, I, I turned out to be, as a jockey, not not good enough, uh, tough enough, or brave enough. But you know, I was, I got uh, professionally pretty competent and rode in all sorts of big races and things. Um, but I wouldn't have got even competent without Frenchie Nicholson. So I was very lucky. But the other thing is, I remember the horses so well. Horses that, uh, and. I think that watching television, which I'm sure you all do, um, and by the way, hello, I see David Ward's watching and Terry Kane, so hi, hi guys, um, there's a sign up saying wave, well I'm, I'm giving you a wave now, but on television there's an element that everybody always says that all horses are lovely and what a super chap he is, well as you all know, not all horses are lovely, and that, that sometimes they can be pains in the neck. Um, uh, and I'm sure you've got memories of horses who, who, uh, um, uh, who were a pain in the neck. I remember there's a horse when I was at Tim Forster's called Mr. Wonderful. He was a big black horse, and what he loved to do, he loved to kick. And he would literally back off uh, towards you and kick you. Uh, and if you weren't concentrating, I mean, he was lethal. He, he, and funny enough, he was—he didn't care shit for anybody. Um, and I, I rode him. I rode him a winner actually. But he—he would—he was very hard to sit on because he was big and uh, powerful. But he wouldn't fall. I don't think he ever fell. But people fell off him because he would just, if he was wrong, he would just completely take a fence on and you, you know, he hit it full on his chest and bash through and out you go to the side. Um, but uh, 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 Mr. Wonderful, I remember there was a filly, the, the filly who had the most, in, I don't know if anyone's ever had this experience, she had the most inappropriate name. She was really quite a sweet filly. She was called Cold Henrietta and Trouble was, when she was in season, she basically practically rape you. I mean, I remember she'd pin you against the wall and rub you against the wall and sort of make great groaning noises. And one summer day um, uh, at Forces, I suddenly got trapped by her after, after I wasn't sort of concentrating, after I'd ridden out, took the saddle off her. And I had to shout for the other lads to come and actually whack her off me. <laughs> Uh, I must say it was extremely, um, uh, extremely alarming at the moment. Uh, the idea of being done in by a mare. But no, uh, um, it, 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 it's horses that you you remember. I mean, there's a big horse that I rode in the national called Time. It's a very big horse with a great white face, but he was very good with his teeth. And one day. Um, I was doing him over and luckily I had a sweater on like this one and he whipped round and he literally picked me up uh, by the back and held me uh, and then dropped me but he got enough of a bite of the sweater that actually uh, I, he didn't tear the flesh but I was extremely sore as you can imagine but I don't know if any of you have been picked up by a horse and you know the, the other thing we're saying is horses you know, some horses can be <laughs> very iffy and in in and out of the stable can't they um and uh, you need to respect them 
uh, again uh, on television to some extent there's a danger of horses sounding like pets which they're not they're wonderful but they're they're race horses and, and they're um, I remember Desert Orchid I used to do quite a lot with Desert Orchid because he was I remember he was just about the best best of memories when I was doing television in the sense that I was doing the main his big big days were at Sandown and Kempton and he, he, he we were that was an ITV Channel 4 course and all through his sort of career he went on for ages and he became as you know immensely popular and uh, he um, would put up with the press to certain to uh, an extent but not forever and one particular morning we came down to film him at Whitsbury and uh, we you know followed him coming out of the box uh, he was went on to the gallops and cantered and picture of him there and walking back and talking to David Ellsworth and Janice Coyle who look after him and the cameraman all the time and everything else and finally uh, the um, Janice got his feed and took it to feed him and the cameraman walked behind her the camera you know how the cameras go and she opened the opened the door went into the manger put the put the the um, uh, put the uh, food into the manger and uh, the cameraman still poking in poking in and then uh, Desert Orchid looks up, sees the camera still looking, and he laid his ears back, and he he went for the cameraman, who absolutely belted out of the box, and managed to get the door. Janice managed to get the door shut, and he came out, and if ever a horse said an f off, I've never seen one do like it. But that was Desi. He was real real tough nut you know um but uh i i don't know if again you will all have your memories of, of horses good and bad the other horse that you all know which um i i have a wonderful memory of was desert was red rum because again uh you'll have seen it on television some of you may have been to ginger mccain's but you could never over exaggerate how extraordinary uh, his stable was. I mean, the Upper Orton Road was basically, it wasn't in the middle of Southport, but it was very much in the sort of main bit of it. I mean, it was, uh, and he, he, his yard was at the back of McCain's car sales. You went through a little arch, which is still there, funny enough. And there was a yard with about, I suppose, eight boxes, ten maximum. And uh, in the kitchen, you look out this little courtyard, and there was old Red Rum with his head out. Now, I went along, and it was pouring with rain one uh, November day after Red, after Red Rum had won three nationals. So it might sort of 77 or 8. Uh, after he won two nationals, I mean second one, so he's still got two more to go. I mean, remember he won. He didn't just win three nationals; he ran in five consecutive nationals. Won twice, and then was second twice, and then the, the fifth time won again. But he was trained in Southport, and I got there on a pouring, pouring morning. And Ginger McCain said, "You better ride him, cock." You know, he said, "I'm going to ride." It. I'd been, I hadn't ridden for so sort of 18 months or so because I was, you know, I was then a journalist. Uh, and uh, anyway, I'd legged up on Red Rum, about five of us, I suppose, only. And, I mean, you couldn't make it up. There we were, uh, in the road. Immediately you had to go, so obviously a fish and chip shop and a uh, Chinese laundry and something else. Uh, you had to go across... Um, <laughs> you had to go uh, across the level crossing and then down um, 
again another road uh, towards the beach which you finally got to the beach that's where you're going to canter the, the only exercise ground you got well i get on red brown but don't forget this stage is the most famous horse in the world and i haven't sat on a horse for a year or whatever it is uh, and um, the i get on him and he is a pain in the neck he jig jogs and bucks and as you all know you're never quite sure whether they're taking the mickey or um uh, you, you you've got to just sit quiet and let them play around uh, and uh, i thought i've just got to try and sit quiet here um but i'm not sure i don't like this much and he's, and he's literally bucking we're in the road uh, and we're going along just walking along the road and then an electric milk truck comes towards us and red rum backs towards it bucking and i realized he was just taking the piss out of me <laughs> and once i realized that um you know once you realize that you 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 knew look he's just taking the mickey and um it was an extraordinary adventure looking back on it when you got down on the beach uh and again when you think of horses now with trainers who've got 100 200 horses amazing all weather gallops and everything else we got down it's pouring in rain you can't really see and there it is we then went in groups of two me and another lad uh and we set off up a harrow track in the middle of the beach and you couldn't see more than well quick quite quickly you couldn't see the horses in front of you so you couldn't see more than about 30 yards ahead of you and um uh red rum funnily enough Massal, he was a flat horse. Uh, he was, he was sixteen two or something. But he was narrow, really. Uh, he was, I mean, he won as a two-year-old, won as an entry as a two-year-old first time out, or well, dead heated. Uh, he, he, um, he was quite a narrow horse in his way, uh, but he was. I thought, well, I'll just hack off with him, gently. But as you all know, one thing you don't want to run away with. Trouble is that quite quickly, the guy on my right began to go a bit quicker and began to get into the sort of parachute position trying to hold on to him uh, and uh, um, he as he quickened we quickened and gradually we're going quicker and quicker and I'm thinking I can't hang on to this much longer you know you think on the other hand I can't see what's ahead it's just an endless beach there might be a uh, some awful obstacle in the way or a hole in the, that I don't want me to do and I'm really quite near the end of my tether and suddenly within 20 feet of me on the left there's a sort of shout I look to the left and there's Ginger McCain in his Land Rover saying go on let him go cock and for about 100 yards we let the two horses went, laid legs to the ground and then literally Red Rum cut off and I, I can't see anything cut off and as he pulled up you suddenly saw the other horses circling um, but he knew exactly what he was doing and I remember after Tommy sat one national on him talking to Tommy he was quite a friend of mine um, and he said it was quite extraordinary riding him in the national because he was looking where he was going in mid-air so when you're in mid-air over beaches he's actually looking where to land rather than just being big bold chap going whack you know. so again memories of horses are, are they live on don't they by the way i've just seen peter drabble hi pete uh, who was he was with only davy at molton like only davy that was way back um he was a really good sprint trainer i remember because pat rowan i think took over from him uh, pete can confirm this uh he had a very good horse um called papa fourway if i remember rightly um uh, uh, ernie davy yes, but he, and Pete rode a winner at Hamilton, wait for this guys, in 1961. <laughs> That's three years. Fuck it. And do you know how much, do you know how much um, uh, Pete weighed that time? He weighed six stone, he carried six stone two, he weighed five stone eight. Um, <laughs> and, he, and Pete says, he once asked Ed Davey, uh, 
Ernie Davy, why he gave me gave him a job? He said because he sent a, a stamped stamped address envelope. <laughs> uh, and Chloe Martin to call in. Some horses just know they're good. Don't have time for our messing around. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, who else have we got here? Katie Ferguson's here. Good. Uh, Derek Morell's here. She's going to phone later. Fran Marshall is here. Uh, she's going to have to go. Mick Marchant's here. Maureen's here. Yes, she, Maureen's talking about Bill Tellwright. He remembers him winning a horse called Wartime. Clunky. The terrible thing is that, um, as Pete's saying there, we remember the first ones, don't we? Um, I remember Wartime. Uh, he won five races one, five races at Cheltenham with him. Terry Kane's watching. Debbie Ward's watching. Susan Derman's watching. Maureen O'Brien Furs is watching. Um, Derek, <laughs> Derek Murrell, um says he remembers me riding Black Justice in the Champion Hurdle. When was that absurd, isn't it? 1968 or something. Funny enough, um, he was a, again. He was a he was a great big tall horse, um, and I rode him one day at um, a spare ride ready at, 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 at Sandown was second, beaten by Des Briscoe. Uh, perhaps I should have won a sort of land in front at the last. And he beat me on the run in, but I then went to we went. He, he went fifth in the in the Schweppes as it was then. And he was twenty five to one in the champion hurdle, but he was he was talented, but um, this is black justice. But he he that day was Persian Wars first champion hurdle, and he finished ended up finishing third, beating about six, six legs, three legs, or three legs, something like that. But extraordinary, and when we came in afterwards, uh, the owners were really thrilled. I was really upset because basically. I just couldn't get him to jump. He he he, he jumped the first terrible, uh, and he, he basically never really jumped properly. And he got going down the hill. You all remember, no Cheltenham, coming down the outside. You, you, you not going very. You try and get going. Got running down the outside, and got really almost upsized with them at the second last absolutely walked through that um, uh, so I then switched across to the inside I remember you may, you may some of you remember a little horse brilliant little horse called Salmon Spray who'd won the champion hurdle before I remember actually Johnny Hay was riding him crucify him against the rail <laughs> poor chap Johnny Hay was furious with me but he ran on to be third um, uh, beating just just beating Remember, you remember a lovely little horse called Semper Vivum, uh, and Tommy Jennings. Were, 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 I just beat them by a head for third. But I came in saying, Look, if he jumped properly, I would nearly have won. But and he, jumping let him down another time because, and this is a true story, um, unfortunately, uh, he went down to uh, Poe and ran in the French. The champion hurdle of Poe finished third there, um, and uh, ran a very good race. Then he, they took him with quite a chance in a big race at Otoy in France, and um, he again his jumpy let him down. You probably know there's quite a lot of runners. You you, you need to get a position. He was in up with them at sort of second hurdle, which is in front of the stands and he completely missed and turned over anyway I was knocked out and I came round in the um, ambulance room and the uh, the British ambassador was a chap called Sir Christopher Soames he's got a son called Nicholas Soames you may know now who's a was an MP for a long time anyway Christopher Soames he was Churchill's son-in-law and quite Churchillian, great big face and um, loved eating and drinking amongst other things, bright chap. Anyway what I remember is coming round and this voice coming towards me saying are you all right? And as he said you're all right the fumes of his lunch, we must have had some armagnac or something really strong, came over and, and I passed out again.
uh, which I, when I saw Nicholas Soames, I wrote a book about Churchill, um, uh, and he, I've always reminded him of that. But no, Black Justice was a, a lovely horse, but he was, he was a clumsy bastard. <laughs> anyway, guys, um, if you have any uh, queries, do, um, do call in because it's that's the fun of this. Is I know you. I can see you're watching. Claire, Claire Ashcroft is, is watching. Harriet Dukes is watching. Excellent. And James Schofield's watching. Very good. And Beryl Weller. And Morag is hello Morag, from up from Edinburgh. Um, uh, and Fran Marshall saying you can't run before you learn to walk. Well, that's the, that is the trouble sometimes, isn't it? You you get you get guys loaded up. Well, the saddest is get loaded up on horses they can't really ride, um, and they frighten themselves and frighten the horses and everything else. But no, um, I I. I Peter uh, was talking about Ernie Davies in the 60s. Well, again, I'd be, be about 1960 or so, I was first at Frenchies. And, I mean, it was all very, very different. Don't forget, in those days, nobody wore helmets. It was all flat caps, and we turned the cap round. And there was a little old guy at Frenchies who was called Ted. And never, no one ever knew what his surname was. A little tiny guy, but he, he was a smashing rider, and he never, never got run away with. Um, but I mean, he would ride out. I can see him now. Ride out with a little old coat, uh, and um, he would, which he'd have tied up tight with binder twine, and then he'd have he'd have ordinary trousers with with a bicycle clip, so to speak, elastic bound. And he, but he'd never get run away with, and he could do two things, which. I've never seen anyone else do, and one of those phrases that says, do not try this at home, um, he, one, you weren't supposed to, to smoke, um, though everybody did, uh, but he, the governor came, he could, he could, the cigarette, he could turn it into his mouth without people noticing, and then when he'd gone, he could take it out again. That was one trick. The other trick, which is, um, uh, we can say it now, but it was um, the way it was in those days, but he, he was very small and quite old, I mean, he probably, now, uh, I was in my 16, 17, but, I mean, he seemed rightfully old, um, but I mean, he must have been in his late 40s, if not 50s, I guess, uh, probably 50s, uh, but he could have a pee without getting off, which was, Incredibly complicated, <laughs> I must say. I have tried it once, and it's not to be recommended. But he didn't want to get off, so that was his his, his trick. So um, um, I don't know if anyone has ever seen anyone do that before. But uh, no, uh, those first days and clambering up onto Pitch Hill and cantering round. And one of the things that used to happen in those days and not just the Frenchies, but everywhere else, is that you canter quite slowly on big open spaces. And so the, the real problem always was trying to avoid being run away with. Uh, when I, I used to go later to Derek Ansell's yard at Middle and Stoney, just near Oxford, and there they used to canter on a huge aerodrome. And fundamentally, they have set off the string. Gradually, everyone used to get again and again the whole lot we run away with because as you know very well uh, if you're you manage to hold a horse comes past you then you're going to go off too but the worst memory i have um was a guy who sadly i think is now not with us anymore maybe anyone knows uh, keith barnfield became a jockey I, I have a horrible feeling he's not with us anymore but uh, keith was I forget what keith was riding but I was riding Time, who was due to run in the National in, you know, about two or three weeks' time. Uh, and it was very foggy that day um, on the top of Cleve Hill and raining. And I Time pulled hard, but I, mean, I was sort of reasonably experienced. So I was in front on him and we did the circuit because I began to I knew it then, which is quite difficult, sort of round 
the top of those diamonds uh, and we're just pulling up and I'm just getting you all know what it's like the end of your horse been pulling you just getting him back down to almost to a trot just slowing down and they got to there Keith whose brakes were finally failing came past me and then as he came past time picked up and the two of us then took off at a gradually increasing pace. And the horrible thing about this story is that as we got going, we knew, we couldn't see properly, but we knew where we were going, because we, it's where we've been, which was along a track between two stone walls. The track was about sort of twice the width of a road. Um, but what we knew, and we, we hadn't got, do you know what it's like, we, got, we hadn't got a grip of either of these horses by now, it would be raining, got the reins were like soap, um, that, that somewhere up the end of this um, track, there was a quarry. And, you know, and these horses are now travelling. One race against the other, it's wet, you can't see, and... We had time to talk, said, look, where's the, where's the, where's the um, quarry, Keith? You know, uh, and what could we do? We couldn't, it, it was, because we had walls either side, you couldn't, um, you, you couldn't turn them. Uh, you, you couldn't run them out. Uh, and, you know, to jump off, I didn't, well, jumping off is, takes a bit of courage anyway, but this was going to run the national. So, <laughs> um, uh, we got to do that and we were I mean it was getting really really worrying and because we're getting so this quarry is going to be somewhere and suddenly there was a couple of bushes uh, sort of gorse bushes in the way and the horse is sort of stopped and half jumped them and in doing that we got a bit of a grip on that at that moment you can also see the quarry ahead of you and because they jumped, we then could swivel them round. But I must say, it was, <laughs> looking back on it, it was one of the hairiest moments that I ever had, but um, how lucky I was to have got through it all. Anyway, guys, um, I've talked for quite long enough. Um, do, um, I see Jane Stevens watching. Um, now, I've got a thing here, it says, bring them on camera. Brian Bivens is running. So, Brian, if I press this, see if you come on. Okay. I'm pressing bring them on camera. What happens there? No, nothing happens. Wave. You waved. <laughs> so, anyone got any 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 um, questions? Um, uh, Fran Martin, who, let's see who else is here. Pat Bartle's watching. Uh, Amanda Clarkson's watching, Louise Gardner's watching, Jane Stevens is watching, um, Harriet Dukes is watching, Derek Morell, Chloe Martin's watching, Maureen Marks, Susan Derman, David Ward, uh, Mick Merchant, uh, Jenny Lee, Marlene Dixon, and Derek. Do you know, I remember Dick, Sid Dale, um, he was a lovely guy, he, he, he was the guy who, um, who uh, trained uh, Black Justice, he, he trained at Epsom, I must say, you know, it's funny, back then, I mean, some very good horses and trainers at Epsom, I mean, I remember John Sutcliffe um, won the, he won the 2000 guineas with, with, uh, uh, won the, he won the clips with Jimmy Reppin or won the Sussex with Jimmy, Jimmy Reppin and what was the other he had a really really good um, he had a Guinness winner written by Jeff Lewis whose name I forget at the moment some will remember it but, I mean Ron Smythe and, and, and John Suckley people had, had top horses and John Suckley's father won he trained specify won the Grand National with, 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 with John Cook um, it, it, it was I remember, um, I remember um, riding a, uh, a 
I think it's a grey, I think it's called Rubentino, a horse of Cyprus, which is the fastest I ever went on a horse. Because I rode him a piece of work, again, no one ever do it now, um, down the five furlong chute at Epsom. On, because in those days, during the, you could exercise on the track, uh, I think it was a race morning, I think it was. Anyway, I remember coming down, jumping off on a sprinter, coming down the hill and going across that road. Um, I mean, I think you're going, what, I think you're going 45 miles an hour down there. Uh, I mean, it really was, it really was uh, spinning. The um, Jessica Kelsall has just called in, saying she found a lot of good horses tended to be the most enigmatic characters, and uh, it's always more rewarding when you find the key to a tricky customer. I quite agree. <laughs> um, but because some horses, funny thing is that quite a few things which are obvious, and people do now, we didn't we didn't do then. For instance. A lot of people now use hoods on horses and we virtually never, no one ever did that, uh, though they've done it in our, in, um, in Japan, I mean I was over in Japan in the 80s and they had hoods on everything, um, an ordinary morning, just to keep them quieter. I can remember a filly at French's that was very scatty and we put blinkers on her in the morning and then she, and she was fine. But the idea of putting hoods on horses just to keep the noise out, which a lot of people use, and they do, they do it now going to the start, don't they? Um, uh, it, it's odd that we just didn't do it. Why not? But then we didn't do lots of things. We, we didn't have plastic rails. We had concrete. Can you imagine we had concrete posts and wooden rails? One day at Toaster, I think it was Clive Searle, the wooden rail come out a bit and the pretty sure it's Clive so the, the piece of splinter wood ran right through his through his leg. Um, I mean there were if you went out through the wing, now you go out through the wing it sort of clatter. Uh, I mean you were you were in a right mess, you know, uh, it was a you you absolutely you could be crucified if you did that. Um, I remember <laughs> remember riding a horse for Guy Harvard it was called, it's only you remember funny name, it's called Pixelated Painter. And he used to pull very hard, but funny if he wore blinkers. But I had him anchored at um, Wincanton. And coming to the second last, first time round, or yeah, first time round, he suddenly, he didn't just go into the wing, he sort of went to the wing, but actually stopped. I mean, we didn't, didn't actually hurt me, he just completely... For no reason whatever, bang. Like some horses, as you probably know, will just, well, I'm sure you all had them, will suddenly stop at home. You can't make them go forwards or backwards, just because of sort of... So if they get their brain in a... their brain in a, in a, in a, in a knot, really, and the more you push them, um, the, more, the more you push them, the more the knot tightens. So you've got to somehow turn them around or whatever, you know? Um, Bob Houghton's here, who, who very kind, said, I'm looking well. Well, I hope you're looking well, Bob, but I'm, I'm not sure how that well I am, but I'm, <laughs> like uh, no doubt some of you, uh, I'm getting on now. What's, it is tricky that when one remembers the early days better than the more recent days, you know, what did win the derby? <laughs> Leslie Ann Davis is here. Linda Clitheroe's here. Hi, guys. Uh, Jerry Walsh is here. Uh, Suzanne Backham's here. Uh... Miriam Hurley's here. Uh, Derek Morrill says he did the second Jimmy Reppin, trained by Sid Deck called Dutch Delight. Yes, this is Derek. I, you know Derek, I can remember our days <laughs> back there. Um, Derek saying, um, the, um, Derek saying that, 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 how would I rate old jumpers against those today? The thing is, I think it's a bit, they were all great horses in the past, and great horses now. I think the best comparison is with footballers. I mean, 
the fact is, if you put them on the pitch with today's footballers, they'd be given the run round because they wouldn't be fit enough. Uh, they wouldn't be fast enough. But if you actually had given them the same training, uh, I think they would be good enough. But I, I think all you could ever judge horses is by how good they were compared to their their contemporaries. And on that judgment, um, I, I do think that Arkell was definitely the best chaser that's ever lived because he was so far ahead of his rivals. And we've had some wonderful horses recently, you know, from Quarto Star, you know, through those um, great two mile chasers of Nicky Henderson's and um, Denman and all that sort of thing. But you know, the, the, the Arkham was a two stone ahead of anything else. Um, I mean, his, his Gold Cups actually were, were hardly any runners, he was doing about three or four runners. And he just cantered around. The only possibility was he might fall or something silly. But I mean, he was winning races, giving away two stone. Uh, with 12 stone 7 and things like that and he was a freak I, I, I'll i never forget standing at the second last um, no the last fence at Cheltenham when Arkell first ran over fences which peculiarly was at the Cheltenham uh, November meeting it was a novice chase there called, I forget what it's called. Um, and he was favourite, but second favourite was a, a horse called Milo, ridden by Ian Balding, um, who was a very hot amateur then. Uh, Milo was a, actually a very good horse, big white face. And they came round the last turn, um, Ark was in front, with Milo sort of somewhere near him. And there'd been big talk about Arkell, he was, he was a rather peculiar looking horse uh, in some ways because particularly he'd be a, but he'd be a five year old then. Um, he he was quite lean, he had, he had a very upright neck, rather like a sort of stag, uh, with big, big ears. And later on when he became very famous, he used to walk around the pallet swiveling his head with his big ears up. Uh, I've never seen a horse do it like that since. But when he jumped the last fence, he just sort of passed Taff, who was sort of quite upright, shook the reins, and he, he just sort of disappeared, really. And I've always felt that when you're really looking for good horses, you, you, you want, they need to do something to your eye. Say, wow. And I remember turning to whoever was beside me, saying, oh, what on earth's that? It was as if he was a, a different species, Arkell. Perhaps he was. I mean, he just was completely different. But other means some very, very good horses since. But um, uh, when a horse does that impression, and same on the flat, you know, um, you want horses to make a really, really big impression on you. And and, and you know, you to see, uh, you know, really good. I mean, when Frankel hit the straps, you know, that was quite extraordinary. But you know, I remember. When Mill Reef hit the straps, don't forget Mill, Mill Reef won at Royal Ascot as a two-year-old, uh, on and he broke the track record over a mile and a quarter in the clips, and in the arc of a mile and a half. So that's fast ground. He also won the Jim Crap Six as a two-year-old on heavy ground by fifteen lengths, and the Ganet in France on heavy ground over twelve lengths. And Funnily enough, I don't think there's ever been a horse who was as effective on both sorts of ground, as, as complete as, as he was. And he was tiny, Millery, because I did a film about it. He was, you could put your arm over him, and he was 15 too, literally. People sort of say horses are small now, but they're usually 16 hands. Um, uh, I mean, Pinatubo isn't 15, if you say he was small, he's just on 16 hands. Um, uh, and but Milby was quite exceptional. The thing about him was, which is what we all look at, is when he cantered to the start, it was as if he wasn't touching the ground. I've never seen a horse 
canter as absolutely effortlessly as um, uh, as um, uh, Milreath did. Is there any Derek's remembering that um, Milhouse, who was the horse, of course, who was a foil to Arkell, and who, when he won the first Go Cup, we thought he was the best we've seen for years and years and years, and got beaten by taking the cleanest by Arkell. He started with Sid Dale, uh, and then the owner was a bit funny and took him away, which is a bit of a swindle. Um, but I can remember being in the weighing room when he he fallen a couple of times at uh, fences, his novice, and Tim Brookshaw rode him. Do any remember you remember Tim Brookshaw? Um, and sort of got hold of him and sorted him out. And and uh, Tim Brookshaw was sort of in Mister Indestructible, and it, and it was it was that year he then had a terrible fall um, uh, at Aitree and was in a wheelchair. Well, he was supposed to be in a wheelchair since, but he actually made himself, he, he had, he couldn't really use his legs, but he, he rode and he actually rode in a race, even though he couldn't walk properly. Um, he was the toughest, I think he was the toughest jockey I ever saw. I mean, he, <laughs> he, he was made of, well, possibly you can't, perhaps nothing has been as tough as McCoy, but he was a very, very tough man, uh, Tim Brookshaw. Um, and completely, unafraid. Someone like me who's sort of quite windy comparatively. I remember riding a novice chaser which he'd ridden before uh, one day at, it was at Cheltenham and saying to him do you think she'll get the mare? Do you think she'll get round? And he, he looked at me with a degree of contempt and said well if she will or she won't as if it didn't matter. Well I, I didn't want to fall at all but uh, <laughs> um, I realised then that uh, I was certainly lacking in the coverage department compared to people like Tim Brookshaw. Anyway, guys, do oh, whoops, I've, oh, I've got I've got a full list here. How about this? I'm brilliant. Miriam, David, Jerry, Adam, Jessica, Amanda, Rod, Sankey, Simone, John, Michael, and Derek. Um, but as I say, I, I'm looking at the screen. So you think you're seeing me? I'm not seeing you, but I'm I am seeing your uh, queries. Um, uh, has anybody got any questions? Do give me a shout. You know, um, I remember one of the odd things nowadays is that um, a lot of horses back back in the back in the time you did get the odd colt running over fences. Um, in fact, the first horse. Um, I won over hurdles on. Was, was, he was a little black um, colt, like about seven years old, then called Articula. He was clever. He was a hundred percent clever. Clogs um, needed blinkers, but would do it his own, his own way. So he suited a kid, but he, um, but he was a colt and, you know, and jumped very well. And there was a, there were quite a few. I mean. The Fortina, who won the Gold Cup, became a really good stallion. And perhaps the most extraordinary um, uh, horse of all was Battleship, who won the 1930, I think, eight um, Grand National, who was 15-2. He was ridden by 17-year-old Bruce Hobbs, who was six foot tall. I don't forget the fences in those days were really, really steep. And um, he um, um, he was a colt, uh, and went back with Stallion. I mean, you, the idea now of running a colt at Aintree seemed would seem extraordinary. But um, and of course, it was a little bit. It's always a bit tricky to have him around. I can remember taking out Akira, trying to sweeten him, and taking him hunting, and he was fine. He was he was perfectly good ride. And behaved perfectly properly until um, for some reason it was, a, it was a white kid's pony and he started hollering and screaming and going all culty and I suppose um, to some extent a, a white kid's pony is a bit like a, a voluptuous blonde to a randy youth um, but I, I remember having to take him home then because he was going to disgrace himself <laughs> but uh, 
No, you, you, you don't really get Colts running over, over hurdle fences at all now. Um, indeed, I don't know if you know the famous phrase, um, which I did use for the, I do, still do some writing for the Times. When Lord North won the um, uh, Prince of Wales stakes of, at uh, Ascot this year, there was a phrase done by, I think it was called George Lampton, famous uh, figure in racing in the sort of twenties. He said that um, he said that um, uh, most horses, a lot of trainers, and all jockeys, would be better for being gelded. <laughs> Um, not that um, all jockeys agree with that, but it's probably it's probably true. Um, anyway, I'm just looking through. Sorry, I'm looking down. Like Leslie Davis is here. Linda Clidrow's here. Um, Susan Beckham's here. Uh, yes, Derek's saying he did he did the second of Jimmy Reppin. What was the other? What was the horse of of John Sutcliffe's who won um, the Guineas called? Uh, Trained by, um, tra trained by, um, written by Jeff Lewis. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry Walsh just remembers. Yeah, Robin Dickin had a very good coat. Um, a very good coat that ran, won a lot of races. I'm trying to remember what he was called. He was a chestnut horse. I went to see him actually. He 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 he, he jumped really really well. There was a the horse of them. I mean, either either jump well or they won't. I'll never forget, there was a horse called Spartan General who became a very good jumping sire and he he became the sire of Spartan Missile, who you may remember finished second to Alden Eaty in the famous uh, Bob Champion Grand National, ridden by John Thorne, who was 50, 54 years old. Anyway, a Spartan General, uh, he, he was a pretty good hurdler. He was reading the horse on the flat. Pretty good hurdler. He went, to, went over hurdles for Fred Rymel. He then, when he was about sort of five or six, put him over fences and he won first time out really impressively. And then he ran second time at Newbury. And I was there, I must, you know, I didn't ride a race, I was standing, uh, watching carefully. And at about the second fence, he took it on, hit it low down, and if ever, ever a horse <laughs> went ouch. I mean, he, he 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 absolutely wouldn't have a cut any fences afterwards. Not surprising. Um, so yes, if a colt's going to jump, uh, they're going to have to be very careful with their um, uh, their equipment. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, Jerry Walsh just said the horse of Robin Dickens was Catastroph. Cap capital K Catastroph. And Derek's saying right it was right tack, who um, right tack that won the. Uh, 2000 guineas for for um for uh, john sutcliffe the, the, funny uh, john sutcliffe jr the most beautiful place john sutcliffe jr er, ermine lodge i think it's all building now um and you go down you go down the road which is now it's all um there's actually a special path but mostly you went down the road with a sort of commuter traffic queuing up behind you um which if you were on a a, a, a two-year-old or something it was quite hairy because they're skittering about and cars going past and everything else anyway um michael guest is here uh <laughs> it is lovely to, to know you're all watching uh charlie newman's here uh katie focus says what's my favorite horse currently still in training well funnily enough we're talking about colts i think it'd have to be stradivarius um uh, who I mean, keeps doing it, doesn't he? And he's not, he's not very big. He's square. He's, he's only about, I mean, I shouldn't think he's 16 hands. And he does holler, I, I must say. He does yell. And he must be getting a bit close to it because I don't know if you saw the television um, when he ran at the last Gold Cup, but he did get his old man out <laughs> and wave it around quite a lot. And... Uh, uh, and, and indeed, uh, Jason Weaver and Mick Fitzgerald were perfectly open about it. Why not? This is a bit worrying because, you know, you, he always has hollered a bit, but you don't want them to get too horny. Anyway, to show you how 
prudish people can still be. I, I was writing for the Times during Royal Ascot and I wrote um, uh, uh, about um, uh, Stradivarius, how wonderful it was, great victory, uh, was it because it was all the better because of the sort of concerns we had beforehand, uh, two really big concerns, one the soft going which goes not to light and I wrote it and his very evident, evident horniness beforehand, which I mean, it's quite a nice sort of easy phrase. And and um, uh, they changed it to his um, excitement. Well, that doesn't, you know, I said to Martin, let me say, I mean, what's excitement doesn't, you know, wasn't he excited? He was getting Randy the silly little sod. But, um, you always worry if he, do, he starts doing that, whether he'll continue on because they, they certainly, the, the owner is a very nice guy, Bjorn Wilson. He told me last year he, he very much wants to run him in the arc. Uh, I remember Ardross nearly, nearly winning, not quite being second, driven by Lester Pickett. But um, he ran very well in the arc. But uh, uh, indeed, if they went very fast, uh, and clearly he doesn't soft ground them and stop him. I mean, I wouldn't mind it be soft ground to stop the others. Um, but I think I think, Katie. I think I'd have to say that um, that uh, Stradivarius is my favourite. Any what any of you have as your favourites? Uh, now, Charlie Newman. This is so that uh, Paul Wainwright's here. Joe O'Neill's here. Uh, Adam Ferguson is here. And racing welfare. I think we've the the. Um, uh, the clock has just struck uh, 12 here, so I think I'm supposed to uh, quit, I'm afraid, but it's been very, very good talking to you all. I hope you've enjoyed it, um, and uh, I'm going to press finish button, which means it's see you soon. Bye. <laughs>